So Claire, great to have you on the show. And I know that in the conversation, when people hear private equity, sometimes they get excited, sometimes they get scared. And it all depends upon your relationship to that kind of business structure. But before we get into the details of your space around um, this topic around uh, private equity and cost cutting it that to be able to make your company more valuable, I want to ask you a kind of a, a large question that might address just about anybody who's on this, um, who's listening to this conversation. So if you think about your experience with private equity, are there some lessons that non-private equity companies, whether they be publicly held, privately held, profit, non-profit, are there some lessons that we could learn that we aren't? And if, the, if so, what would they be? Absolutely. I, I, you know, the whole goal of private equity is to take a good company and make it great by examining everything. It's an opportunity to like stop and reset and reevaluate and make sure you're not wasting time, resources, things that aren't really core to your values or your mission uh, as a way to drive just so much more success out of the same kind of core architecture. So it's about the time and the space that is afforded to you when you're acquired by private equity that is often not considered when you don't have that kind of changeover. Where you're in nonprofit, for instance, you know, you're constantly chasing the annual fund and trying to plan for a campaign. And it's hard to say whether or not this one activity that we do is necessarily a good one. Um, and it can be hard to say, oh, we need to bring in other people to start examining us. What's kind of cool about private equity is that the, the those consultants, those kind of examiners come with a package. Some people don't love it as much, but I'm a big fan. Okay. But the, the whole, the the contrast or the the blending of the financial results that one would want for a company that is going to be bought and sold and balancing that with the, the purpose, the mission, the values, the culture. How does private equity companies look at that side of the ledger? Are there yeah. some private equity companies that are mission centered as equal to or greater than their financial interests? As to a certain degree, but there are always going to be uh, limited partners that expect a return. So there will always be a financial interest. So when I said you take a good company and go great, go and try to make it great in the private equity model, essentially the thought is this is not venture capital. We're not trying to place a bunch of bets to try to find the unicorn. Rather, with private equity, you take a company that has the fundamentals and then you try to make its value grow um, in a meaningful way over a period of a about five to seven year hold. Um, and then you hope to sell it for quite a bit of uh, growth. And at the worst case scenario, you sell it for what you bought it for. So there's no real loss like in, in venture capital if we're doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. um, so when you talk about like the goals and the approaches and how to evaluate the mission and values versus product changes versus just straight cut all the costs, what you do as a as an operating advisor in these private equity companies is you come in and you say, well, here are our financial metrics and here's what they correspond to. So our financial metric might be how our revenue is growing over time. And we believe that that corresponds to our frictionless onboarding process and the fact that we don't need a customer to talk to a salesperson in order to buy. That can be a theory and you can test out different ways to go approach that theory. But ultimately, there's a connection between what we do and how we behave and what we think affects our financial statements as a result. It's all the excess that is not core that might be somewhat reflective of your values or your purpose that is not that is up for up for scrutiny. Um, uh, what we focus on is cloud costs, which is the uh, the cost to run your software in the cloud. And there's often stuff running that's been left running and has some kind of tag on it saying, do not turn off. Uh, that kind of example, even if it's not doing any good, there's, there's that through marketing and sales and customer support. There's all kinds of ways where uh, we're not taking apart the true value of an organization uh, in order to make it an even better financial engine. 
And then finally, when you're talking about those who just kind of like look for the second bottom line or the the impact to the to the world even better, often it's because they they choose a industry to go after that is going mm-hmm. to be in betterment in a in in a direction of of affecting a positive change in the world. Um, but ultimately, they do that by making those companies much more effectively run and, and higher value. There's a book that you probably know from your days of reading books uh, called the E Myth. That is one of those that a lot of us have on our bookshelves. I know I've got it around here somewhere. That basically was a um, an example of if you were to take a company and try to pretend that you're going to sell it as a franchise, uh, where would you be able to create automation and process improvement such that the owners and those who are the subject matter experts could leave and others with some adequate intelligence and understanding could just sort of follow a bouncing ball and create the same sort of value. Such like when you go into a Starbucks anywhere in the world, you're going to get the same sort of Americano, whether you're in Beijing or whether you're in Biloxi, uh, Mississippi. So the, the idea was always, I thought, a valuable one for even those who were not trying to franchise their companies to kind of look at process improvement. Is there a similar type of idea that you would suggest companies taking like, what if you were to sell your company? Not to say that you would in three years, five years. Um, what would you need to do in order to make it valuable? It's so funny that we were talking about this today because I was just had this conversation with my marketing company about this as to what if we were to sell our company in three to five years, what would we go through? And so here you show up <laughs> on this podcast and we're talking about it. It's like, wow, that's uh, that's really fascinating that that serendipity happened. But is that a useful exercise for organizations to to go through? And if so, what would they want to look at? How would they go about that? Yeah, I, I I love that model and the use of the concept of franchise is so powerful because in have, inevitably a franchise is kind of the shell of a business and it has to be able to be operated without the people that are in the business. And so um, oftentimes, especially younger companies are all people. If you acquire you know, a smaller company, it's because of those people. So it's a very interesting mind shift and it's very effective. Um, ultimately, these questions have a lot to do with industry and stage of business. In my background, it's all software as a service is what I have done my whole career. And so what we think about in terms of that mind shift is what can this company look like if it's no longer pursuing growth at all costs? What if it did not have to receive a single dollar more? And how would you change it to continue to be extraordinarily successful? What we had in the years, in the last 20 years, has been a process where uh, we are willing to spend whatever it takes in order to continue to grow our customer count, our daily active user count, our revenue in the door, our advertising dollars, all of those things that say, I'm a thriving business, but at the same time, we're constantly asking for more and more cash in order to be able to do that. And the premise is that because it's so cheap to run these software companies, just the software itself, we can spend out out the back door on the people inside the organization trying to grow it. And ultimately, it will not always be receiving cash. That's how an effective company works. Mm -hmm. And whether or not it's through private equity, there's a moment in which a leader has to go from being a creator to being an operator. And that it that accounts for the CTO, that accounts for the CEO, at CMO, et cetera. And so I like to have the conversation about if you never received another dollar, what would you change in order to continue to be an extraordinarily successful business? Well, so do I mean, if, if a company is trying to, if a group is trying to purchase a company, are they, do they have the stomach to allow for it to be not profitable for many years. Is that something that, I mean, you hear the stories about Amazon and Bezos saying, hey, guess what, shareholders? Again, this is not an exact perfect example, but we're not going to make money for another, what, three, four, five years. Just just hang tight. And of course, they've done quite well. Thank you very much. Is there that sort of stomach for, to wait it out for a company to grow and, and get its sea legs under it? Or 
are people coming in and say, yeah, I'll, I'll write a check, but I want to see a return on investment within three years. So, uh, yes, there's an incredible amount of stomach for this in a way that will actually shock you. So there's this mindset that the return on the investment is not a hold return. It's not, I'm not getting a dividend. Nobody's giving a dividend, getting a dividend yeah. in this yeah. kind of world. What I'm getting is the sale of the company on a new value. And historically, and even today, valuations are primarily getting driven by revenue growth. And so if your revenue is growing even more than it was before, you're going to be able to sell for more even if you didn't have any kind of profitability. Hmm. That being said, think about how much you can do with a company that is also profitable. It's based on this math that we could operate software companies without its people. I think that's a faulty assumption. I think that you ultimately have to be able to deliver new features in order to sell new clients. You need to be able to support and continuously upgrade your software. But we don't in our financial structures actually put those people who do that work as up there in cost of goods sold and affecting the gross margin and therefore affecting the valuation. Instead, we say, oh, this is excess spend. This is R&D. I can capitalize this. This is not a big deal. No worries. Um, but if you do go into a private equity owned company that has been quite aggressive and they have cut a lot of the R&D staff, the company is pretty much you know, running with its arm behind its back. It doesn't work. So mm -hmm. this math, this, pro this premise that you don't have to be profitable is based on that faulty assumption. Um, we do, I think, have to reconsider all of that. But at any rate, I'm here and my whole purpose is to help CTOs navigate this process and start becoming leaders instead of followers, get rid of that whiplash and just try to direct to hmm. financial outcomes um, through this whole experience. So for those who are uh, lay people in this whole topic, what are some areas by which value is assessed? How do you determine what's the criteria? What's the rubric? that an organization would go, hey, we would like to purchase you. You look like you would be a company we'd like to take on. We see that in three years, you're going to be something that would uh, really produce a, a nice profit. What, what are the criteria? I mean, aside from top line revenue and ROI, what other things do people look for? Yeah. So there's the revenue growth metric, like I said. There's also gross margin, which is the revenue subtracting any cost to deliver against the customer contract, which is essentially in a software company, customer support and cloud hosting costs. Um, and an ideal, an average gross margin for a software company is about 65 to 70%. And if you can get that number like 85 and above, that affects your valuation quite a bit, makes you look like a rock star. Um, you're going to see customer acquisition cost be analyzed, which is not only the cost to actually purchase each one, but then also the return on over time. Like, it, does it take two years of a client's contract in order for it to pay back? There's also free cash flow margin, because if you do subscription-based relationships with your clients, then they pay up front for an annual contract. You get the cash in January for an expense that actually lasts the whole year. So you could be unprofitable, but have cash flow positivity that's quite impactful and allows you to invest elsewhere. Those are some of the biggest ones. And, and frankly, profitability isn't one of them. I, I think it should be, but not as much anymore. Well, what about the idea around just the, the people side of the, that ledger again, the management team, uh, their experience, their background? their pedigree, you know, is that considered? And and if so, what do they look for? Yeah. Uh, it yeah, is. maybe. <laughs> Not so much. I think that you can tell a company is going through private equity turnover when you look on LinkedIn and they announce their new CEO and they announce their new mm. chief sales officer. Like they, it, there's a lot of management turnover when you get bought by private equity, even if that wasn't the original intention. And it happens time and time again because there's this inertia. You can't break the inertia so often when somebody has found success, personal success in doing it their way, and they struggle to shift. They struggle to shift to whatever the new thing is, the never, new goal set. And when they don't, then oftentimes they, they get replaced. Those that actually stay on, though. Is there some sort of secret sauce that makes that transition from one ownership to another successful? Because, for example, I have one particular company that we work with right now. They've been through probably, I don't know, two sales and they've kept the CEO. They've kept the management team through all of those sales. Now, maybe Amazing. that's an anomaly. Maybe, maybe that doesn't normally happen. But 
and I haven't quite figured out yet uh, why that hasn't happened. You know, why there hasn't been a change of, of leadership each time the company's been sold. But in your experience, when those particular managers or leaders have stayed on during the, the sale, is there something that is a telltale sign as to why? I think you have to be a student. I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. There are some people that do incredibly well through that switch. I actually think about um, Bullhorn, the staffing company. They're one of those that has just been an incredibly consistent team through a lot of different owners. Um, you have to be a student of what's new and what's the priority set as well as somebody who's willing to reevaluate the assumptions on a regular basis against a new set of facts. And not to take it personally, because what you decided a year ago was a great decision because of it. And there may have been a result that was good and there may have been a result that was bad, but it's not the result that dictates the decision. And that there's a new decision-making process each time new information comes in. And to be really open to that and to learn and grow um, requires a a pretty next level leader, I, I would say. Hmm, interesting. So do you find that when a company is, um, do most companies go out and seek a purchase or do companies get sought out after? It depends. I mean, you know, a lot of firms have a preference. Um, so when you're when you're seeking a, a purchase, you're going to talk to and use an investment banker, most likely, who will then shop you around to a variety of private equity firms. Mm -hmm. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of firms actually nowadays that are actually doing their own prospecting. They become sales engines on their own, trying to right. find all the companies out there that have never taken fundraising. That's a real prime target for private equity, um, is a kind of self-built bootstrapped organization. Um, so it's kind of both sides and, and each private equity firm is trying to construct a diversified portfolio for their partners. Hmm. So Claire, tell us a little bit more about your secret sauce and what your company does and what your niche is all about. Yeah, so we are all about the CTO and making sure the CTO levels up into this new um, financial savvy approach to uh, building their technical side of the house. We started with a specialty in cost reduction for Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud. Uh, we still do that. We do a lot of that. Uh, and we help people um, make those changes very quickly uh, and, and across portfolios, actually, like we'll, we'll have companies within one portfolio kind of all go through the process together. But what we think about when when the CTO needs to level up, we think about how they approach new companies that are being acquired and rolled into them. We're thinking about how they budget and how they plan for the next year. We're thinking about how they educate people in their team uh, about this financial structure and how they communicate what they've done in the boardroom in a language and a methodology that really makes sense to their ownership and provides value uh, for communication back and forth. And this can be the founding CTO who can easily do this. And we're we're here and we're ready to ride alongside or if you've just been dropped in um, and uh Basically, everything about tech and everything about software as a service is really unpredictable from the finance standpoint. And instead of having a response of saying, I don't know, which is actually a really true answer for a lot of people who are technical leaders, the answer has to be, I will come up with a process and I will make it and I will show you how we're going to improve and continually um, make ourselves and our results predictable, which, which can be a real huge challenge. So I'm putting a little bit on the spot. If you were, if you're talking about the CTO as being sort of your prime focus within an organization, what would you say? You're at a cocktail party, you're sitting around grabbing some peanuts, and you got your martini in hand, and so forth. You meet up with the CTO, and they say, "Oh, really? It's an interesting kind of line of work you're in, Claire. What are three recommendations you would have me, you know, consider to improve what I do? What would you suggest that they consider doing?" I, number one, examine all of your people on every team, and you don't keep people just to have a person who does the job. Um, they're, they're not going to help you. And you also need to evaluate whether or not they are adjusting, given all the information that's coming into them about how life is changing, if they're adjusting with it. Um, I've seen a lot of CTOs kind of go down with the ship in, def in defending people who've just been people that they worked with for a long time and who aren't mm -hmm. necessarily kind of moving in a new direction. It's a very hard thing to do to reevaluate those people, um, but it's the number one thing you have to do. 
Uh, number two, uh, it's about developing a very specific way of planning for the future financially. So that's your roadmap needs to have a financial component. How much are we going to be able to pay back and in what period of time? And your budget needs to be very, very predictable. It can't just be, well, we spent $7,000 on this one function last month. So it'll be $7,000 next month. It has to be a lot more structured. We have a whole kind of like stack and layer process of layering into creating those budgets. Um, but those things are things that you don't want to be caught being asked more questions and having no answers. That, that's really important. Um, and the third is you need to be in charge of your own destiny as new companies get acquired because almost every single private equity owned company acquires in order to grow revenue. Uh, and so it's your job to actually do your own diligence. And we actually teach CTOs how to hmm. evaluate the team that's coming in, um, take your ego out of the room and make sure that you're bringing the best from them instead of assuming that you just won and you owned them. Uh, and also the financial implications of evaluating all their spend. It sounds like the CTO needs to sort of adapt, for lack of a better word, almost like a, a, a CFO mindset in some ways, a very much an analytical perspective on people, on, on budgets, and on um, due diligence. Yeah, and, and really they're a general manager of the business because there's so much that is owned by the technology team in a software company that it's typically the responsibility of the CFO um, in other organizations. Aside from the obvious AI, are there other types of major changes you see that CTOs are facing today that they didn't face before? Like what's what's your prognosis, if you will, in terms of technology coming up in the next five years or so? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with the process of producing code that's ready for production. Uh, mm. We've seen this trend in the last 10 years or so towards making it easier and faster. And what that actually does is create a decent amount of bloat in terms of the cost to run every user's experience. If you think about a car, when you buy a car, it's gone through the production line. And before it went through the production line, that production line was value engineered to make sure that Ford is making the most money on that car when you buy it. A lot of times, nobody can think about how to approach that with software, but it's my parallel is every time a, so a user has an experience online and connects to your system, there's a cost to that whole user's flow and experience. And very much clearly understanding that individual unit cost and how it gets adjusted by the types of code that you have in your systems can take a really good company to great without having to do crazy things like no longer buying printer paper. <laughs> Sounds good. This has been uh, eye-opening and it's obviously it's not a space that I spent a lot of time in, but I've certainly learned a lot. How can people learn more about your company, what you do and uh, the kind of value you create for them? Sure. I'm, our company is Aimably. It's A-I-M-A-B-L-Y.com. Um, and I'm Claire Milligan. You can find me on LinkedIn. And I also like to write a lot on Medium with the handle Claire Designs. And so what's up for you in like the next five years? What's your vision for yourself and your company? We are super focused on making sure that we solve all the problems for CTOs in private equity ownership. We started as a software company. We moved to like software and professional services. We're trying that out in a new approach that's um, kind of software powered and it's exciting to be able to build on new software experiences. So um, it's a lot of building, a lot of growing, a lot of being nerdy about what we offer and, and helping more customers. Great. And you're located out of California? We are. We actually, we're, we're fully remote, but yeah, we, we work with companies yeah. in Europe and Australia and India and yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Well, it's been great to know you, Claire. Thank you so much for your time. Likewise. Thanks, Dean. Yeah.